All right. We'll be um, looking at the, the passage here, Romans 4, 17, about where we left off. We'll be looking through uh, verse 25, the end of the chapter, and then we're going to look at uh, 11 verses in chapter 5. So got a lot to, to cover here. So let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for your word. Thank you how you have revealed yourself to us. Thank you that you have revealed that salvation, it's by grace through faith. So, Father, as we look into this chapter here, uh, just pray that you'd be teaching us just the simplicity of the message, that it is faith, and that we would also see the significance of that faith, that that is how you justify us, and then be, that you'd be, you would reveal to us as well, Father, the, the blessings and the results of that justification as we see in chapter 5. So, Father, we ask that you would be teaching us. We ask that your son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified through this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've just seen how Abraham was not uh, declared righteous by his works, the work of circumcision, or by, uh, by any law-keeping, but that it was of faith, according to verse 16. It says, therefore, it is of faith faith that it would be according to grace so if it wasn't through circumcision it wasn't through the uh, law keeping or or human works then what what did abraham contribute and so we'll be looking at that as we progress through the rest of of chapter four so let's let's read the passage starting in 417 referring to abraham let's let's catch the tail end of 16 uh the faith of abraham who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So I'd like to turn back to the book of Genesis and just to, just to look back at this promise uh, if you, um, John had already read um, for us in uh, Genesis 12. So we're, let's go to Genesis uh, 15, where the, the quote here is uh, taken from. So Genesis 15. And this is after uh, Abraham, Abram has recovered Lot, and his small army has, has, has routed a, a bigger army. And also, Abraham refused to take any of the spoils. He just got the people, his people back, and gave the spoils and said, I don't, I don't want them. Said, the, you know, the king of Sodom could have those things. And so, here we, ha we pick up in chapter 15. So, after these events, after his little army has, has routed a, a big invading army, uh, these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. So probably encouraging him. Look, don't worry about that army coming back to get you. I'm going to protect you. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? So important background here. And the, uh, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring and we saw earlier that the Lord had promised him offspring there in chapter 12 many offspring indeed one born in my house is my 
Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So if we could turn back to, to Romans chapter 4, please. So let's look our way, look, um, work our way through this passage here. And we see the, the foundational emphasis here of this passage. That Abraham's testimony proves that justification is by God's power without any human effort. So we're going to see clearly that it, was, it is by faith. And we're going to see that Abraham did not contribute anything except one thing, and that was faith, looking to God and what, what God's promise was. And so it's, again, God's power without human effort. So uh, let's look at verse 17 and kind of start right there. So is it, God had given him the promise that he would be a father of many nations. And that was, uh, that was a big promise to a man who had no children and who had not been able to have children and who were getting advanced in years. And so that was a big promise. And we see that uh, in the presence of him who he believed and God who gives life to the dead. Okay, the God of resurrection. And we'll talk about that in the last part of this chapter. And also the God who calls things which do not exist as though they did. The all-powerful, almighty God who created from nothing. So let's see. Abraham's faith was not based on his own ability. But we see his faith is in God. Who did he believe? God. Contrary to popular belief, God helps those who cannot help themselves you know we have that human we have that human bit of wisdom and you've probably all heard it many times maybe you've even said it you know and uh that oh god helps those who help themselves god helps those who help themselves and we're going to see here that abraham didn't do anything but he trusted god and a god who helps those who cannot help themselves And, and uh, look at I like back verse. Look back at verse sixteen. It's of faith that it might be according to grace that the promise might be sure. So it's God's promise, not anything to do with human ability, but it would be a sure thing because God is going to do the work. And so let's look at verse eighteen. Uh, so Abraham, it says, contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. So Abraham's faith was not based on his feelings. You know, Abraham felt like, well, man, where, you know, I kind of feel like where is, uh, you know, where is the the promise going to come from? But he's, he's looking to the Lord. And so he's, he looks past his feelings and looks to the Lord. And then let's read verse 19. And so see, here we start to really see the situation that Abraham is in and why he had to look past his feelings. Because if he went by his feelings and what was around him, he would, we see in verse 19, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So we see if, Look back, it's like, yeah, I don't feel too spry. <laughs> so God, <laughs> I sure don't feel, feel up to it. So. And then we see here in this, this passage that Abraham's faith was not based on human possibilities. So as Abraham looked at the situation, he looked at the human possibilities here. He says, well, oh, this ain't going to happen. You know, they're past childbearing years. And she had been barren. They had not been able to have children. So the human possibilities here, he didn't have anything to draw from. 
So he looked past that in faith. In verse 20, and he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith and he gave glory to God. So Abraham's faith was not based on sight. Again, as he looked around in his human viewpoint or human wisdom, he, he said, well, I'm going to trust God. And the scriptures tell us we walk by faith, not by sight. And then, you know, that's what faith is. Faith is really looking away from ourselves and looking to God, the God who is able to do it. And so also in verse 20, we see there that, that Abraham was strengthened in faith. A Abraham's faith grew stronger as time passed. And the, um, as I think this was touched on earlier, uh, maybe early this morning, Brett talked about the, the obedience of faith. That the more that you know God and who he is and his character and what he's like, the more that you know him, the more that you will trust him. And the more that you trust him because of who he is and what you see, then the more you will obey him. So the more you know him, the more you're going to trust him and the more you're going to obey him and walk with him and trust him for his promises, even though you don't see how they're going to happen or you don't know exactly what he's going to do. So Abraham's faith grew stronger over time. And we, we do see, if you look back at Abraham's life there in Genesis 12, I think it goes to 22 or 24, and you do see times when he, his, his faith was not strong. But with this promise here that God made him, it says he, he believed and God credited it to him to righteousness. So Abraham learned that God was a faithful God and that God was going to keep his promises and that he was trustworthy. So Abraham grew in faith throughout his life to the point where he trusted God's word. And let's look at verse 21. Abraham was fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So God makes promises, but he can also keep those promises. There's nothing in the in the world, in the cosmos, that can offset God or counter his word to you. And so Abraham's faith was not based on his circumstance, but rather on God's promise and him knowing God fully faithful and able to perform what he had promised. And as we saw there in Genesis uh, uh, fifteen six, Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. So let's look at verse 22. We go to that quote again. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness there in Genesis fifteen six. So when was he counted righteous? It wasn't his works. It wasn't circumcision. It wasn't law keeping. Because again, Abraham was declared righteous when he believed. That was before, again, before circumcision bef um, and before the law was given. So we see just the emphasis on faith that Abraham did not contribute anything from a human perspective or a human effort perspective other than put his faith and trust in God. So Abraham was counted righteous when he believed. And let's look at verses 24, <coughs> excuse me, 23 and 24 through 25. Now it was written... So we've gone back, all the way back into Genesis for this, this uh, great and classic example of faith, righteousness imputed by faith. And God takes us back to this for us, for our benefit in verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for 
us. It shall be imputed to us who believe. In the same way Abraham was declared righteous by believing. And believing, remember, the, uh, the most important thing about faith is the object of faith. Believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And so we see the reason that uh, Paul has taken us back to this story here is the fact of faith. No human effort involved. And Abraham is, is not the only one who is saved by faith. So are you. The same way. And the scripture that says, and Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness was written for us too. And again, Abraham there in the end of verse 16 called the father, the father of us all. So he is the, the classic and perfect example of faith without human effort. In verse 25, <clears throat> so we see in 24 and 25, we see the elements of the gospel. Uh, 24, it, it says, uh, in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who delivered up, who was delivered up because of our offenses. So delivering up, meaning delivered up to death there, his death on the cross, was delivered up not for his own sins because he was sinless and was therefore qualified to be our substitute. He was delivered up for us. and was raised because of our justification. So we see here in, in uh, 24, this written testimony declares that only faith, and that's the only thing we see, Abraham offering faith. Only faith can make us right with God, believing God, trusting God. We're made right with God the moment that we believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So the moment someone makes that choice to put their faith in Christ, they are counted righteous. And we see the gospel clearly spelled out here. Jesus delivered up for our sins as our substitute and raised again for our justification. And so this, this um, we, as we finish chapter 4, we begin to, to see the, the aspect of the, the resurrection here. And in the resurrection, being raised as part of our justification. So it wasn't just his death for our sins. It was also his resurrection that was part of our justification. Because God has not only taken care of our sins and and. and and pay that penalty through Jesus Christ, God has given us a righteousness. And our righteousness is in Christ. And our righteousness is, is in a living Savior who was raised up. So that resurrection of Christ was, was, was crucial because that is our life. If he, had, if he had died for our sins and stayed dead, well, guess where we would be? Okay. He was raised up. So, this, the significance of this is that uh, we have a, a positive standing now before God. Not only are our sins paid for, but we are now in a positive standing before God because we, are in a re we have a resurrected Savior. And in that resurrected Savior, we have His righteousness on our account. So now we are in a positive standing standing before God. We didn't just go like back to neutral or back to, you know, this ground zero where we have to prove ourselves now or earn, our, earn things or merit things. Now that we're kind of back ground zero, our sins are kind of paid for, but now we got to work it out somehow. No, we are moved on to a, a perfect standing in Christ. And we have a justification in a risen Savior. We're in a positive place. And that'll lead us into to chapter five. 
So we are made right with God when we personally trust. And I like that word personally. It is personal. It, we we want to make that clear. It's an, it, for each person needs to make that choice for themselves to personally put their faith in Christ and his death for our sins and his resurrection. And then we see there that reference to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And we'll look at that again as we look at the confusions of the gospel. And we see there in 1 Corinthians 15, that chapter really focuses a lot on the, the gospel and the resurrection and how the resurrection is, is critical uh, to our salvation. And we'll see that even more in the rest of 5 and into Romans, Romans 6. Okay, so let's uh, transition here. Uh, Brett, I don't know if you want to stop for questions or you want me to keep, keep going. Or um, you, we, could, uh, we could take a few questions, but uh, you go ahead and work them. Oh, okay. Okay. So we've, we've seen the three types of sinners. And, you know, God leaves no way of escape. You know, God is good like that because he doesn't want anyone to perish. So he wants to cut off anyone's escape strategy for escaping his judgment or thinking somehow they will be excused from judgment or that they can ignore it and get away with it. So we saw the immoral sinner. We saw the moral sinner and the religious sinner. And we saw the conclusion on all three. All are sinners. Every man. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then we see the three tenses of salvation. We're starting to, to work through there. We see we're in justification. And that's in 321 through 521. And then we'll see sanctification and glorification. In, this, in chapter 3, we see justification explained. And you know, it's always good to keep the big picture in mind because the big picture like this helps us to handle the verses clearly and accurately and be sure we're, we're handling them according to the main, the main thrust of the, of the passage. Justification exemplified is where we've seen, and we've seen these Old Testament examples with Abraham and David, and then again with Abraham, again just driving home. It's not works. It's not law. It's not a religious ritual of any kind. Specifically here we saw circumcision. It is faith, and that is in accord with grace. And so now as we look into the next chapter, we're going to start to see justification's end results. So we see we're justified with God, and that's just the beginning. We're going to start to see the results that, that come out of that and the great things that God has done for us through that justification. Okay, let's see. Looks like it's um, ready. Yeah, it's ready. Okay. Questions on this subject so far and as we finish up Abraham and get ready to go into chapter 5. Very clear example of um, how to look at what faith is. Faith is not a work, uh, but uh, faith is based on a work. Faith is based on the work of Jesus Christ, and um, so we've seen that. Okay, shall we keep plowing ahead? Let's do it. All right. Okay. Yeah, so Jesus Christ did the work. He completed the work. And I love those words he's, he said on the cross. And John uh, recorded those. It is finished. It is finished. What we needed to be right with God was done, was completed. And I'm, I'm so thankful that it is a, is a completed work. It's a completed work. And that's why the, the key word, one of the key words, I guess you'd say, in biblical Christianity is the word done. It is done. It is finished. It is accomplished for us. So what's left to do? Put our faith in the work that has already been done. And that's why it's not do this, do that, do the other thing. Like all other religions in the world are do this, do that, do these steps, do some more. Well, that didn't work. Well, try these. And it's do. But in biblical Christianity, done. Done. Finished. When I graduated from uh, college, I used to have a recurring nightmare that I didn't really graduate. And the nightmare always had the same theme. There was one math class. 
that I had been putting off and putting off, and I actually forgot to take it. And it haunted me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and think, I didn't graduate. Oh, no, i got to take that math class. <laughs> but then I would wake up and i think, you know, I finished. It's been done. I don't have to go back and do any, uh, any of those calculations. And so God wants us to, to calculate and reckon on the work that has been done and finished by Jesus Christ. Okay, no nightmares here. No waking up from asleep and wondering, well, where, where do I stand with God? Does God really accept me? Or maybe as I, like, uh, maybe you felt or I think other, uh, talk to other people, they've related to this. Like uh, when my, early in my Christian life, I, I just, I didn't have a good understanding and I almost felt like, okay, God saved me, but now I'm kind of on this probationary period, you know, and I gotta, I gotta just kind of show that I'm, I'm for real or that I really meant it. And I just had this, this sense of you know, being on probation and not really being clear. And so these, these very truths here around justification make, make a huge, huge difference. And understanding these things, this, 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 the simplicity of them, but, it's not, it, but there's so much significance in this simplicity because it's based on what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And so let's read Romans chapter 5 as we transition now into the, the end results of justification. And so he starts out with the word therefore, which is always nice. I like the way Paul uses that word for us. It's kind of now we're going to shift into something based on what I've already been teaching you. Brick by brick, I've been laying this out for you just clearly giving you different examples. And now we're going to move on to kind of the significance of that. So therefore, having been justified by faith, reminded right again, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, we, uh, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For when we were still sinners, without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now received the reconciliation. So now we begin to see the results of justification. And in verses 1 through 5, we're going to see the privileges of being made right with God, having been justified by faith. So we want to keep that foremost in our mind. These are ours. Again, now these things that are accruing to us and these benefits that we have, again, we're reminded we didn't get them because we, we earned them or merited them. We have them because of faith in God and in, in his son Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. So let's, let's look at these first uh, five verses here and we're going to see, let's look at one and two here. Uh, we're justified by faith, having peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have also, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So first we see the accomplishment here the the in a sense the past view we have this accomplished now we are in a state of peace we have peace with god that relate that broken relationship that sin 
sins, that sin severed and separated all man, mankind from God, those who have put their faith in Christ, we see they have peace with God. And if you were to ask people, if you were to take a poll of people about what, what they would like to have in their life, usually the first thing is say, I'd like to have peace, or I'm just looking for peace. In a sinful planet, a sinful world, a sinful human race, people are looking for peace. And, you know, the world has its, has its ways of looking for peace. You know, we really kind of saw that with the different sinning lifestyles. We saw the immoral style and just maybe just looking for peace, doing their own thing and trying to drown out God in, in their, their lifestyle and just trying to forget about him and uh, do their own thing or just, just trying to be moral and just hoping that, you know, our good outweighs our bad and that, you know, somehow we'll, we'll be able to take solace in that. Or just trying to have use some kind of religious activities as, as a balm. But we see that peace comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And then the, the present perspective, we have a, a new privilege here and a new situation in this present perspective. Through faith in Christ, we gain access to God. And we have a permanent standing in his grace. So we didn't do anything to earn it to get it. So therefore, we don't have to do anything to earn it to keep it. But we have a, a permanent standing in God. And the Bible says through faith, you've been born again. You're a child of God. And once you're a child, you are a child. Just like, you know, I think everyone here is probably a parent, except for some of the young people. Uh, then for a young person, you could think of your parents, you know, you're always going to be your mom's child or your, you know, your dad's child. You can't change that fact. You could change your name. You could move to China and you'll still be your parent's child. And so the same way when we're born again, we, ha we are a child of God. And then we have, we have this permanent standing and it's a standing in grace. A standing in grace. So now we're in, a, in an ongoing relationship with God based on grace. And then we see the, the future aspect here at the end of verse 2. Let's look back at that just to keep in the text. It says this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So our future outlook has changed. We don't have to have dread or uncertainty. But we rejoice that God guarantees we, will, we absolutely will experience his glory. We can look forward to that future day when we will be glorified, as we'll see in, in the future chapters of Romans. But we see a little kind of a sneak preview here. And so in Romans 3 and 4, we're going to see we have a new outlook on life you know as believers we have a new way of looking at life we can now take God's perspective on life on our life knowing that God cares about us and knowing that we're in a relationship with him and something that I've I've uh, just been thinking about a lot is you know the definition of eternal life sometimes we think of eternal life well it's eternal that has to do with time and you know it means it lasts forever and and sometimes we almost think that eternal life is in the f out there in the future but in John uh, John chapter 17 I believe he's in uh, he, Jesus says and this is eternal life that you know God and his son Jesus Christ whom he sent so it's interesting that definition of eternal life brings us right into the present that it is it is a you're in a relationship with God so eternal life starts the moment you put your faith in Christ and you're now in a relationship with God and so now you can have a totally new outlook on life because you know you're in a secure relationship with God and these things here are so important because there's many believers that are that are plagued with nightmares or you know plagued with doubts or just just uh, you know concerns because they you hear so many things out there in the world of Christianity and so many things are taught so many wind and waves of doctrine that want to take the focus off Christ and his finished work. 
And th- those things have, have dangerous ramifications on people. And this is stuff where we put our, our head down on the pillow at night and we sleep good. We sleep good because we know it's done. And so we have this, we have, now we have the ability to rejoice in our trials. So it's not that we become a believer and all of a sudden the road in front of us gets straight and there's no curves or speed bumps or ups and downs. It's not that all of a sudden our life, um, there goes that gavel. It's, I think it's going to step on our toes. <laughs> uh, um, it's not that the road just gets easy for us. But now we have a whole new way of looking at life. Instead of bitterness and frustration and, and all those things that basically outlook that leads to some kind of sin or, or, uh, or difficulties or just that wake of, of destruction in our heart or in our mind or you know, in our life, we can look at trials differently. So let's look at three and four for further information on this. So we have this rejoice and hope, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations because God's not punishing us. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character produces hope. So as we see here, we see we, because we know that our trials produce endurance. We know that God's not punishing us, that we're in a relationship with God through faith. We're justified. We have a standing in grace. And now we can know that God is with us. And we have those, the promises he's given us, the, the past and the present and the future outlook that we have. So when we go through trials, it's totally different now. It's a totally different perspective. God is with me. I can trust God. I can have faith in a God who has saved me. He is faithful. Then we also see, because we know that our trials produce integrity, and that is a good definition of in- integrity is proven character. It's f- a faithfulness under trial that uh, f- uh, it's a proven has a proven character to it. And so we know as we go through trials, God is not abandoning us. God's not mad at us. So when things come up in our life, we can know that we are standing in grace. And now we can take this trial uh, looking to God and having God's perspective. And as we do, that produces, that produces character in us. And character, um, you know, God... As we look to God, he, he continues to work in us and grow us. And we also see, because we know that our trials produce an optimistic anticipation, hope. We know that, that God's not abandoning us. We know that God always does good things. He's a God of the resurrection. You know, you may think, well, this thing is so messed up. There's no hope for this. Well, that's what the disciples thought when Jesus was, was, uh, was crucified. They thought, man, this, wow, this is terrible. And then you have the resurrection. And a demolishing of death. And so we have a God that raises the dead, who calls things into existence, an all-powerful God. And so we can, we can trust him for whatever we're going through. And now let's look at uh, verse 5 and some additional results of our justification. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us, given freely, a gift. We have the gift of salvation, and here we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is talked about further in Romans. So now we have a new, we have that inner peace and we also have uh, this new inner peace of having God's love poured out in our hearts. And that's poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to uh, have you turn, please. Let's do a cross-reference to the book of Ephesians. Let's just look at chapter 1. And
And just as the Holy Spirit drives these, these points home to us, they, they really give us a, a deep peace and really can, can grow us uh, spiritually in our walk with the Lord. And uh, let's look at verses uh, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Let's uh, keep reading here. Um, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And that would be another thing that people want besides peace. They'd say, I just want to be accepted. I want to be accepted. And here we see that we are, we are made accepted by God's grace and we're accepted in his loving family in the beloved. And then if you would also turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. So he wants us to be rooted and grounded in this love that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and, uh, and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Because let's turn back to, to Romans there. And so now we're going to see the, the permanence of these things that God has given them to us. We didn't earn them to get them. We don't earn or merit them to keep them. So these are a permanent gift. A per, the permanence of being made right with God. And we're going to see now the Trinity uh, at work here. And there we saw in verse five, uh, five kind of the, the last half of five, we saw the Holy Spirit given to us. So we see Romans 5b, God the Holy Spirit indwells us permanently. He never leaves us. And we see there uh, Ephesians 13 and 14 and says we get the Holy Spirit the moment that we put our faith in Christ. Let's go ahead and turn to that one, please. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Is in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So at the moment of faith, the Holy Spirit is given to you, again as a gift, freely, is given to you at the moment of salvation. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and this is a guarantee of your inheritance. It's a guarantee. It's a permanent thing. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. There's that word redemption, of the purchased possession. We were paid for by Jesus Christ, bought at a price to the praise of his glory. So we see we have the indwelling Holy Spirit that that occurs at the moment of salvation. And also we see in Romans 5, 6, and 8. So let's, um, we see the Lord Jesus Christ is our perfect substitute. So we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and we have the Lord Jesus Christ who is our perfect substitute who paid our sin debt. And let's look at this here in verses 6, 7, and 8. For we, when we were still sinners without strength, just like Abraham said, he had no strength left in him. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We had no strength to save ourselves, but God sent his son to die for who? For the ungodly. That's neat how God meets people right where they are. They don't have to ungodly themselves to be worthy of salvation. And back to Romans 4, 5, it says he justifies the ungodly. You know, God meets people where they are, but he doesn't leave them there. 
meet you where you are, but he doesn't leave you there. And so we see um, also verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one dare to die, but yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But we're not talking about good men. We're talking about sinners in verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love. So there's that love of God always going out, out towards sinners. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us while we were still sinners. Not when we were righteous, when we were sinners. And so now let's, let's look at the uh, question there is for whom did Christ die? So we'll move through these uh, fairly quickly here. The references are there if you'd like to um, look, look them up. But it says Christ died for all. Well, he had to because all were sinners. So he died for all. And, you know, that's, a, that's something that often comes up. People will have a question about God's character. And they'll say, well, how could a loving God send anybody to hell? If God's a loving God, how could he send anyone to hell? Well, we see that uh, a loving God, God so loved the world that whosoever believes shall not perish. So God made a way that no one has to go there. He doesn't force it on anybody. People have to accept that gift and put their faith in the work that has already been done. So if anyone goes to hell, they go to hell with their sins paid for. So a loving God has paid for the, for the sins of all. So no one has to bear that punishment because Jesus Christ did the perfect sinless substitute. But if someone doesn't personally accept that, then they will go to hell. But their sins were paid for. There was once a federal case of a man who killed a, a federal mail carrier, postal worker, and uh, the man was found guilty and he was sentenced to be condemned. Uh, to be executed and the uh, president at the time I think it was Jackson actually pardoned the man and gave him a pardon so that he didn't have to suffer the death penalty well the man actually rejected the pardon and so well, I don't want the pardon and so the, they didn't actually they didn't know what to do with with this situation so they had to send it to the Supreme Court because here was a man who was sentenced to death but then it was waved off but then the man rejected rejected it and so the pr Supreme Court found that the man had the right to reject the pardon and he was executed. So we see that Jesus Christ has paid for the sins of all, but people have to personally accept it. And, and Matthew 20, 28 says he died for many. We see he died for the ungodly, which we just, just covered. And that's uh, backing up to ungodly. That's kind of a, it's a good verse to use if you talk to someone who's just really hung up on, on something um, that they just feel like they've done something that can't be forgiven. And this, this verse, I think, sometimes will help, help that, them to see that God meets you where you are. Like uh, women who've had an, sometimes women who've had an abortion have tremendous guilt and they just think, ah, how can I ever, how can God ever accept me? And, uh, so I think that, that sometimes helps there. So he died for sinners. And Martin Luther, Martin Luther was a man who, who really, you know, uh, had a heart for God and his word. And he was a man that he seemed like, uh, it seemed like he went through a lot of uh, spiritual discouragement where Satan was really trying to, to discourage him and throw in those, those darts uh, to Martin Martin Luther and and uh, Martin Luther was always just he just had this sense of like you're just you're a sinner you're a sinner you're just a sinner you're no good you're just a sinner and then he would remind himself well who did Christ die for sinners he died for sinners <laughs> he died for sinners and then we have these great results of justification he died for every man he died for the world. John 3.16, he so loved the world. The emphasis on that verse being in the word so, he so, how much the, the emphasis falls on that word so in terms of how much love God had. He so loved the world. He died for the whole world. He died for the whole nation of Israel. 
He died for the church. Okay, and the church, the church is made up, the real church is made up of believers. Church is not a building, it's people who have put their faith in Christ. He died for his sheep. He died for Christ deniers even. Says those people there are denying even the Lord who bought them. He died for all of us. So what a great Savior. And through grace, it's available to all who will believe. And another one, I like this one uh, personally. He, uh, you know, Paul personalizes it there. He died for me. And so, of course, we can all say that. He died for me. And now let's, um, we're going to look at uh, verse 10 here. And God the Father gave us precious promises. We have his sure and firm promises through the death of his son. So let's read verse 10. For if we were enemies were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more. So even better. We've even got better things coming our way. This is kind of the beginning much more, having been reconciled, having that relationship restored, we're going to be saved by his life. So his death paid for our sins, but now we've got this positive standing before God and a risen Savior. And now it's, it's drawing our attention to his life, that he is alive. And if, if, if his death accomplished that much for us, what is his life going to accomplish for us? We see we, we are justified because we have a position in a risen Savior. We have, and that gives us a positive standing before God. So let's back up to 9 and 10. And we want to, uh, we want to look at three perspectives here. And we're going to see the three tenses of salvation again here in 9 and 10. 9 and 10, much more than having now been justified uh, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And then for if we were enemies, we're reconciled through his death. Much more now, having been, we shall be saved by his life. So we see, here we see the three perspectives. We're going to be reminded of these three tenses of salvation, which will be further developed in the book of Romans. We see, of course, justification, which we've been looking at. We were justified forever by his death at a point in time. And that's the point in time you put your faith in Christ. And then we see the glorification in, in uh, the second half of 9, where it talks about we shall be saved so if you ever see a part of your salvation sounds like, well, that's not, doesn't sound like it's really happened. Well, yeah, there's, there's another part of our salvation which is guaranteed. It is coming. It's as good as, as, good as you know, there in a sense because it's a promise of God, but it's something we're not fully in the benefit of yet, and that's glorification. We'll be saved from the wrath of God in the future. And we'll see that again in Romans 8, that that is part of our salvation that is guaranteed to us. And also our sanctification there it talks about being saved by his life. So we're going to be saved in a, in a present ongoing sense. And that, that is a salvation not from the penalty of sin now because that's been settled. But this, this has more of the salvation from the power of sin. We're going to have the life of Christ in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us to give us victory, to give us power to live the Christian life so that we will be able to experience and, and live out, live for the Lord in a daily way by faith. And then 5.11, we see the product of being made right with God in our daily lives is we revel in our God. No boasting, Freely given. And we also rejoice through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we recognize this new standing. The solid ground that we're standing on. No, no, there's no carpet going to be pulled out from beneath our feet here. We have a new standing. And it's by, f by faith that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And so let's finish there looking at verse 11. And not only that, but we also rejoice in the Lord 
through our rejoicing God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received. Again, it's received as given, not to be taken back. We have received this reconciliation, this restored relationship, this eternal life that starts now by being in a relationship with God. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the, the, the truths that we see in Romans 4, that salvation is by faith, it's by believing you. And we thank you for the, the results of that sanctification, that we can now have peace with you, and we can know that we have it. We can know that it's not based on things that we have to do, but it's based on Jesus Christ and his finished work, and that you have given us your Holy Spirit freely to, to work in us and to, to grow us and to, allow, to give us that uh, freedom from sin's power in our, in our life. So we thank you, Father, for your grace and all the things that you have given us so freely. And thank you because it's finished and secure that we can have that peace. and We don't have to worry about losing it or if we're good enough to keep it. But we can rest in the finished work of Christ and live in, in enjoyment of our new relationship with you in total security, in total peace, and we can rejoice because of that. So help us to not get bogged down, Father, in our life just by the different things going on, but let us remember that in our trials we can look to you and our standing never changes and that we have y you available to us and that relationship to look, look to you and walk by faith with you day by day. So I ask that you'd be glorified in our lives through, through what you've taught us here and through these reminders and uh, things you've emphasized to us, Father. We just th give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. exciting part of the book uh, because Paul's going to set us up for understanding how to live the Christian life. And I've had people tell me before, you know, they, they've taught Romans one, uh, chapter 1-1 one, one through 5-11 and then a race through chapter 5-12 uh, through 21. Raring to get to chapter 6. But for some reason, the Spirit of God had the Apostle Paul stick this passage in there that talks about two identities. And I want you to understand that this is a, an incredibly significant setup for us to understand the spiritual life. I call it in identification truths. Because Paul is going to identify the whole world in two men. And someone rightfully said once that the, when, when God looks at this world, he only sees two men. He either sees Adam or he sees Christ. The first Adam or the last Adam. And Christ is not the second Adam. That was Seth. Remember, Seth, Adam had a, a son in his own image, in his own likeness. He was kind of like another Adam. You're like another Adam. But there is this last Adam, Jesus Christ. So you have the, the first Adam and the last Adam, and God sees the whole world in one of these two men. And you are either in Adam, the, the old Adam, or you're in the new Adam. And whatever is true of your Adam is true of you. Whatever is true of your federal head is true of you. It's kind of like, you know, if, uh, if Obama today declares war on Russia for some reason, and all of a sudden troops are over there and we're sending missiles over and bombing them, guess what? You are automatically an enemy of Russia. And if you travel around the world and some Russian agent or military guy sees you, he's liable to kill you. Why? Because he would deem you an enemy. Why? Because of a decision that is made by your leader. And so whatever your leader does comes true of you. And that's what we're going to see in this. And if we'll begin to understand that God groups us in these two groups of people. And he, and he shows us that what is true of our leader is true of us. 
it helps us to understand what we're getting into in chapter 6 when he asks, asks you to understand that you have been crucified with Christ, what is true about him in crucifixion and in, in death and in resurrection is true of you as well. So let's begin to unpackage this, but we need to go back over our chart. And so we've seen the grace of God in chapters 1, 1 through 17 in the gospel. We've seen the three types of sinners, and we've seen most of the teaching on justification. So let's go back through that. We're, we saw Paul's accountability for the gospel. We saw his addressees, the Romans. We saw his aspiration in the gospel. And then we saw this great acclamation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Next, we looked at the immoral sinner and saw the hopelessness of immorality. We looked at the moral sinner and saw the hopelessness of morality for being saved. We saw the religious sinner and we saw the hopelessness of trying to be saved through religion. And then we came to this conclusion, the whole world is hopeless. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But then we came to this glorious passage where he began to explain justification in chapter 3, verses 21 to 31. And he explained how we are made right with God. And, and then he e exemplified it by two men, Abraham and David, and what they discovered. And what Abraham discovered is that God makes people right with himself justifies people based on their faith and not their works he understood that God justifies people based on on their faith and not the law he saw that God justifies people based on faith and not their religious rituals like circumcision or we could fill in the blank with our religious rituals he saw that Abraham understood the difference between uh, faith and works very clearly and he also explained how that David said the man that it God doesn't count their sins against him is a blessed man and David understood that that God saves ba people on the basis of his grace on unmerited favor and so we we saw that exemplified in chapter 4 and then we saw these glorious end results. Every Christian has those results whether they enjoy them or not. They have peace with God. God does not treat you as an enemy any longer. You are now part of God's family. He's given you the spirit to live in you. The Trinity, as we saw there, is at work in securing you. We saw that God has endured him, endeared himself to you. And you will be saved by his life. And so we see that God is, is working even in your, uh, as a result of justification, he's going to continue that process right on through. And then we, now we're in this section where God identifies us all in one of two man, men. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all live. And this is chapter 5, verses 11 through 21. And that's where we're going to be today. Truths of identification, a precursor to sanctification. You miss this and you won't understand sanctification properly. There are two identities that sum up all of humanity. And you can see these two identities in the teaching that Paul gave concerning the resurrection and the resurrection body that we will have in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15 so we can see how Paul juxtaposes Christ with Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. You always have firstfruits, don't you, on a tree when, you, when your apples come due on your apple tree? There's a few apples that always are the first ones to come do. And you eat them, and they're usually a little juicier and a little sweeter for some reason. They're bigger sometimes. But they, re they tell you, those first fruits tell you there's better fruit yet to come, or there's more fruit yet to come. And so this is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a signal, a sign to us that we will be resurrected. 
He's the first fruits. We're going to be resurrected in like manner ourselves as it goes as time goes along. Verse 21. For since by a man came death, and who was that man? Adam. By a man also came the resurrection from the dead. Who was that man? Christ. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, and that is true, every one of us are born dead because of Adam. And all of us die physically because of Adam. And all of us will eventually spend eternity in hell if we stay in Adam because of Adam. So also in Christ all shall be made alive. Whoever is in Christ is guaranteed to be made alive. We could put this in our eternal security group of verses. Because in Christ, every one of his will be like him in his resurrection. And then let's jump over in the same chapter to verses 45 and forward. Verse 45 says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a life-giving soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit and so with adam god breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul but now it's as though with a believer god breathes into your spiritual nostrils and you become a living spirit in because of being uh, attached now to christ it says there that the last adam be um, the last adam became a life-giving spirit However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. In other words, Adam, the first Adam came first. The last Adam came afterward. Verse 47. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven, and that is Christ. Christ is the last Adam, but he is the second man. He's not the second Adam, <laughs> Big, big difference, but it is a difference. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven. In other words, God has two men that he has chosen to, be, to engender people through. The first Adam gives us life in a physical sense, but he gets us in trouble. By being born into Adam's family, you're born into trouble. But when you're born again, you're born again into Christ's family. And that gets you out of all the trouble you have. And that gives you a new identity and makes you a new person. In verse 48. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly. As is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Now in this sense, I believe the context here is talking about our spiritual bodies that we will have. But at the same time, there is an identity that we have with our Adam. The last Adam has given us uh, a heavenly, we are fitted for heaven in him, whereas the first Adam fitted us for earthly living, verse 49. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, and especially in a bodily sense at the resurrection or the rapture. We are going to be bearing the image of that kind of humanity, of the Christ kind of humanity. Now, with Adam, you got a human nature, didn't you? Well, with Christ, you get a human nature, too. It's called your new nature. And that new nature that you get from Christ at the point of your, uh, at the point of your salvation, that new nature can not sin. Because the Bible says that which is born of God cannot sin. But that which was, came from Adam, that which is born of Adam, sins. And so we need to understand this. This helps us in our theology and helps us in understanding the scripture. Especially when you get to 1 John chapter 3, where it talks about that which is born of God cannot sin. And it cannot. Your new nature is the nature that you will have throughout eternity. It is a nature that is in the likeness of Christ. But you don't have your new body yet. And that new nature only flourishes in the new body. But it's in you already. 
you have that. That part of you has been born again. And you have a new nature and you have an old nature that you inherited from Adam. And so as we think about that, let's go back to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and forward. Romans 5.12 says this. We're going to read through to the end of the chapter. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law was in the world, uh, for, for until the, the law was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who, had, who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, as through the one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through the one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, I'd like to pray. Our Father, we look at these scriptures, Lord, and we realize that um, we're opening a big package here, Lord. We're, we're opening up something that has many facets, Lord, and uh, we're going to be looking at, at, at uh, part of your masterpiece here, Lord. And I, I desire to be a good tour guide. Um, Father, and, and yet I realize that when we're looking at the greatest jewel on earth, the Word of God, uh, we require, Lord, your intervention and your teaching. And so, Father, we ask you that you would teach our hearts today and open up the Word of God in, a, in, a, in an incredible way, Lord, to, to give us understanding and insight. And, Father, your servant stands in great need of your of your intervention, Lord, and using of the words, choosing of the words, Father. And at the same time, Lord, we just will entrust our, our, our own hearts and our own lives into your care. Uh, for indeed, to handle the word of God is an awesome task. And so we ask you, Father, to give us the wisdom we need, to, work, give us, uh, to, to both will and to work for your good pleasure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin to open this up. God identifies all humanity with or in one of two men, the first Adam and the last Adam. Adam from the garden and Adam from heaven. God deemed you as a member of one of these two lineages. You can, you can comb your hair like a a person who is in the lineage of Christ and yet your hairstyle won't get you in. You can dress like someone that's in the lineage of Christ and by dressing and appearing as that way won't get you in. To get into the lineage of Christ requires a new birth, a birth from above. Adam and Christ are federal heads who represent the two branches of humanity. Thus, in his epistle, 
Paul often referred to the believer as being in Christ. You see that extensively in Ephesians chapter 1. But you see it all over the scriptures. As believers, our new identity is now we are in Christ. We were in Adam. But if you don't get that, then you could live your whole Christian life identifying with the wrong person. You know, Adam, he tried to put leaves on to make himself acceptable to God. But you know that when God appeared, he said, you know what he said to God? He said, I, I, was, I, I hid because I was naked. But if you would have looked at Adam right then, when he said that, he was fully clothed in leaves. But in the presence of God, our clothing, our externals, our personal righteousness is nothing. We're naked. And so uh, if you see yourself, in, if you are in Adam as an unbeliever, you have nothing that God can accept. And yet you can be in Christ and be fully clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But in your mind, you can be back in Adam thinking, oh, I've got to put something on. I've got to make God accept me. I've got to be something so that God will, will want me, will desire me. When in reality, being in Christ, you are fully accepted in him. In fact, the Bible says that our lives are hid with Christ in God. That we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 2. That, that God already sees us in the person of Jesus Christ. Without any effort on your part, without any change of externals, without any dress up, without any makeup, he sees you eternally unified and identified with Jesus Christ. And nothing on this earth can change that because that was a work of God. The Bible declares you are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians says we are sanctified in him. We are set apart in him. God has already placed us in the person of Jesus Christ. And what is true of Jesus now becomes true of me because of my identification with him. And you know that he is 100% of the time, uh, t seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year accepted by the Father. That's, that's your standing. And you did nothing to earn that. But that's the truth of you because you are in Christ. In God's assessment... Whatever is true of your federal head is true of you. Whatever is true of, of your federal head, if you are lost and still in Adam, just as Adam is rejected by God outside of the garden with a, with a, with a flaming sword between him and God, you, have, you are separated from God. And there's no way you can sneak around the back door and get into the, back into the garden, get back to the tree of life. You are cut off from God. But if you are in Christ, you're back at the tree of life. You're back in the presence of God, at God's right hand in the person of Jesus Christ. And so when, when God looks at Christ, he's looking at you because that is your position now in Christ. And that is an awesome thing to understand. And when you understand that, it changes your perspective on life. You must grow in your understanding of who you are in Christ, your true identity as a believer, in order to enjoy your position to the full. Remember, that's why Peter said, as he went out the door, last verse in his last book, the last words that he said on this earth that we know are grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have this. Grow in it now. And so we must grow in our understanding. Because you were born again, God identifies you with Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever. That's how God sees you. John chapter 17 says this. John 17, 23. I in them and thou in me that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them even as thou didst love me. You see, as God loves the Son, he loves you. Because we in him, 
he in us, we are united eternally with Jesus Christ. And that's incredible. What about you? At any given time, in both your daily life and in your thought life, you are either identifying yourself with Adam, your former head, or with Christ, your new head. This is why Col Colossians says, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. The, the Lord would tell you to identify with Christ. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says, If you have been raised up with Christ, and we have been, we are seated in the heavenlies, we've been raised up to heaven with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see, God has unified you with Jesus Christ and you are seated in the heavenlies. Now you can set your affection on heavenly things instead of setting your affection on these, these earthly things that so tie us up. So in chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, we see a heritage given to us by the two branches of humanity. And so you, you've kind of got to see this uh, as it is. You have uh, God who... Who created the world there's he put Adam here and then he has Christ here the last Adam and he sees the whole world in one of these two men he either sees you still in Adam or sees you in Christ and he's he doesn't see you back and forth in that way you're either in Adam or you're in Christ and in Ephesians chapter 1, he simply declares that as believers, we are in Christ. Chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, Adam, our old head, gave us a terrible heritage. Look at verse 12a, 5, 12a. It says this in verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man... Sin entered into the world, and death through sin. So through this one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, into the human race. Sadly, we received the sentence of death from Adam's sin. Therefore, uh, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. Now that's not fair, is it? Why should I suffer for what Adam did? Isn't that, isn't that un, uh, unfair? That God would deem me a sinner based on Adam? I didn't eat that fruit. That's not fair. It's not fair until you see what God has done. Because the Adam's demerits became your demerits. But now, Christ's merits become your merits. It is a blessing that God looks at two federal heads because I don't have to accomplish anything. I just have to be in the right family. You see, if I'm in the right family, what is true of my federal head is mine. So over here, what was a curse to me over in, in Christ now becomes a blessing and becomes an incredible blessing because he is now my champion, and everything that he has won, I have won in him. It's like last week when Texas A&M beat Alabama. <laughs> there were some people up there that were screaming happy and some that were screaming mad. Now, if you ask them and say, what are you, what are you upset about? Because we lost. And you look at them, you think, man, you're four foot eleven. I mean, how, how did you lose? No, they lost in, in, in the Alabama football team. Now, if you had gone to the other side of the stands, there was a, a, a little crowd over there that was doing all this hand-waving and <laughs> chanting and everything. And if you'd asked them what, what happened, they'd have said, we won. And you'd look at them, you and what army? <laughs> you didn't win anything. But in their team, they won. Now, in Adam, we all lost. But in Christ, we've all won. He's our victor. And so rejoice that God does this. 
rejoice that he does it because you don't it it takes you out of the having to perform to be something death was handed down to us because of our relationship to adam look at verse 12 and so death spread to all men you know we we know that death spread to all men because all sinned Not only did we inherit death from Adam, but like him, we also deserve death because we have personally sinned. That's what verse 12 says, because all sinned. So just like Adam sinned, we have sinned. We belong to him. We're doing what he did. From Adam to Moses, before the Ten Commandments existed, everyone died because of sin. Look at verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was, is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. Since they could, not break, uh, since they could break no law, as had Adam, God did not impute their personal sins to them as a transgression or a breaking of the law. But they still died because they were still sinners. Even though God did not impute their sin as a transgression, in other words, a transgression is when the sign says, uh, do not walk on the grass, and you walk on it anyway. It may be a sin to walk on the grass, but when there's a sign there, and you walk on the grass anyway, that's a transgression. A transgression is a willful sin. When you know it's wrong. Well, Adam was the one that had do not eat the fruit. And they ate it anyway. But from that point on, people still sinned. People still walked on the grass, even without the sign. But when Moses came along and the Ten Commandments were given, now everybody had ten signs that they could see. And they would clearly know when they're breaking the law. Even though God did not impute their sins as a transgression, Humans from the time of Adam to Moses still died because of the sin nature and the sin penalty imputed or passed down to them from Adam. Verse 14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. Even though people from the time of Adam to Moses did not break a law as Adam had, all like Adam died. Adam was a type of Christ. Now, how could you be a type of If you look at Adam, a type is tupos in, in the Greek. Uh, and it's, it's, the, it's what's left behind. It's what we used to call mule tracking back home. Uh, when, you're, when you're working, doing sheetrock, and you put the nail in, and you miss a nail and you hit the sheetrock. They used to call that for me when I was working as a sheet, doing sheetrock. Uh, they would say, quit mule tracking. Because I was leaving a dent in the sheetrock that looked exactly like my hammerhead. And if they had got my hammerhead and put it in that hole, they would have known who had done it. And so a, a, a type is a dent left from a blow. And so the, in, in the Old Testament, there were, these, there were these images that in the New Testament come to full light and fruition. And we, can, we understand. And so it's, a, it's an image. Well, Adam here... The Bible says is a type of Christ. But when you look at Adam, everything that he did was different than what Christ did. How, how could he be a type of Christ? I'll tell you, I can be a type of Christ. He is a progenitor of a race of people. Christ is a progenitor of a race of people. That's the only way they're alike. They each have a, they each have a group of people. Later on, it's going to be called the many of Adam or the many of Christ. It's their group of humanity, their branch of humanity. And so God sees all of us down the line from these people. You may be down here. If you're still in Adam, you're over there. If you're in Christ, he sees you over here. 
And so Adam had his group, Christ had his group. In that way, Adam was a type of Christ. Verse 14, where do I see that at? Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, uh, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So Adam, the old Adam, the first Adam was a type of the last Adam in the sense that each one of them would have would have a race of humanity, and I, I don't know how else to call them. I guess race isn't a good thing, but there's only two races of people. There's the race of the first Adam, and there's the race of the last Adam. And there, there are not black and white races or green or whatever color might be out there. Adam was a type of Christ in that he was the progenitor of a race of humanity who all bore his likeness and his characteristics. So Jesus is going to be the progenitor of a race of humanity who all bear his likeness and his characteristics. And that's good news for me and you. As a type of Christ, Adam stands before God as the representative of his branch of humanity just as Christ stands before God as the representative of his branch. The sin and death, sin, death, and judgment that Adam possessed, his children possess as well. In the same way, whatever Christ possesses, his children also possess. So are you accepted today? Well, where are you? If you're in Christ, you're accepted in Christ before God. If you're in Adam, you're not accepted no matter what you do. Verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Through his sin, Adam passed the death penalty to all that who are in Adam. That, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died. His many. I like the way that the Apostle Paul chose the term many because nobody, I, I mean, God knows. But um, that just means all that belong to him. All that belong to Christ, that's his many. All that belong to Adam, that is his many. I would say that the first Adam has more in his lineage than the other by virtue of the fact that few are they who find the narrow road, the Bible says. But there is an exit plan. Conversely, in Christ, we receive the free gift of God's grace because of Christ's righteousness. Now, where do we come up with that? We'll look at verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression. But we do get a free gift. We look down in the verse. It says, much more did the grace of God and the, and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. So, the grace of God. The free gift of God has abounded to all of his, just as the transgression of Adam abounded to all his. Now, what would you rather have? The transgression of Adam or the free gift of the grace of God? I like the free gift of the grace of God. This free gift is not like the death curse that the man Adam bestowed on his line, except that all who belong to the federal head, the many of an Adam, inherit it. And in that way, the free gift goes to the many of Christ. Every one of his received grace. They received the free gift of eternal life because of him. This free gift 
is the grace of God abounding through the man Christ Jesus to his lineage, the many of Christ. Abounding. Now let's look at two legacies. Two legacies. Starting, in, uh, or let's read verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who had sinned, who sinned, for on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. So Adam gained us the judgment that came from his one transgression. Can you imagine that? One transgression brought God's judgment upon the whole human race. We were all, when Adam was kicked out of the garden, we were all kicked out of the garden. When Adam was given the death penalty, we were all given the death penalty. That's tough, isn't it? But boy, when you look at it on the other side of the coin, it's good news. So we'll see the other side, but let's talk about Adam's side of the coin. Adam's one sin brought God's judgment against us. God's judgment against us brought our condemnation. Christ, on the other hand, gained for us the free gift, saving grace, resulting in you being made right with God, being declared to be right with God as a free gift. Christ procured for us the, salva the salvation, uh, salvation grace of God, the saving grace of God. This free gift resulted in God's declaring us to be righteous. Verse 16 again. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. So Christ had many transgressions placed on him. In fact, he had not just one transgression of Adam passed on, but rather he received the transgression of everyone on the world, in the world. And he paid for that in full. He paid the penalty for that completely. And as a result, he gives grace to all of us, the free gift. And that makes us what he did, that, that many transgressions being placed on Christ allows God to declare you to be right with himself, to justify you in the courts of heaven. So Romans 5.17. For if by, one by the, one transgress the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of, the, uh, of grace and of the gift of righteousness will re reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So there's two dominions. There's this death dominion. Adam's transgression brought death's dominion. His reign is a reign of death. That's all you'll get from Adam. If you're in his dominion, if you're in his lineage, you have one thing coming to you. Death, the curse uh, from the transgression that he passed on to you. Adam's one transgression caused death to reign as king among his descendants. And you think about it. For one sin, he ruined the entire human race. How many sins have you committed? Three. Yeah, three and a half. How many human races could you destroy if we were to tally up all of your transgressions? Boy, aren't you glad that on the other hand, grace came. Since the fall, death has reigned through Adam, the one man among all of his people. Ever since the fall, death has reigned. But on the other hand, Christ's obedient act. Remember he was obedient to, the, to, the, to death on the cross? Christ's obedient act, his death on the cross, brought life's dominion to humankind. He gives to his own both abundant and eternal life. Remember Jesus said, 
Out of your bowels will flow rivers of living, living water. That's what he promises to those who are in his lineage, to those who believe in him. We have the living waters of God flowing through us in the sense of abundant life. And, and let's read verse 17b. It says, uh, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace. Where do we receive that? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And of the gift of righteousness, where do we get this gift of righteousness? By being in Jesus Christ. Will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. You see, we're the ones that really live. The ones that are in Christ's lineage are ones that are really living on this earth. Don't be deceived by the, by the glitter and the glow of, of those that are living in Adam's family. Because they may, they may pretend to be living but they are living dead. They're zombies. They're not alive. We are the ones who are alive. We are the ones who have hope. We are the ones that, that are truly living life. And God offers to you that life. But it begins with beginning to identify yourself for who you really are. And don't have an identity crisis. Don't see yourself still in Adam. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are now in Christ. And what is true of Jesus Christ is now true of you. You have his righteousness as your righteousness. You have his acceptability as your acceptability. He is at the right hand of the Father, and you are seated in the heavenlies in him. And every time the Father reaches out and puts his hand on the, on the shoulder of Jesus and says, Son, I love you, he's saying that to you. Because he loves you in Jesus Christ. And there is no rejection of God's children in Jesus Christ. We have all been made to be in, uh, uh, citizens of heaven. That's our home. That's our identity. Now start living like you're a child of the king. There's a story about a woman who, who was at a place of starvation. She was living in a in a in a uh, an apartment and the 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 owner of the apartment had given her two days to pay she was several months behind she knew she was going to be put out on the street her children were in the corner crying they were very very hungry the the um she had a cell phone but other than that none of her bills were paid she was destitute she didn't know what life would bring for her and then all of a sudden, in that moment, she gets a phone call. Now, she was afraid to answer the phone call because normally it was a creditor. But she didn't recognize the number. It was a new number. And finally, on the fifth ring, before it went to the voicemail, she hit the button and said, Hello? Is this so-and-so? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm lawyer such-and-such. And I'm, I want you to know that I've been looking for you a long time. You see, you have a, a, an uncle who left an incredibly large inheritance for you. Hundreds of millions of dollars for you. And she's like, no, this is a joke. And as she began to talk with a person, the person began to come up with data and information. And she was convinced when she got off the phone with that man, that it was true. Now, she had nothing in her house still. Her cabinets were still empty. Her children were scarcely dressed. And yet, her whole world changed in an instant. Why? Because she realized that she was somebody that she didn't know she was. And you see, you are somebody that you may or may not know you are. Because God identifies you with Jesus Christ. And if you'll begin to identify yourself with Christ and quit seeing yourself as this street urchin out in the, in the cold trying to get God's attention and trying to get God to love you, rather understand that the moment you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were identified with Christ, and he is now your identity. He's now your standing. And what is true of him is now true of you. And you didn't merit it, and you never will merit it. You're never going to be good enough to, 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 for that. God just puts you in the right family and in relation with the right person. And this is something 
that Paul is trying to show us that in the many, we have received the grace of God, the free gift, this place of privilege, this place of acceptance. That's who we are now in Jesus Christ. And this is biblical. This is not some, okay, I want you to close your eyes and imagine yourself to be this way. This is your reality because of Jesus Christ. And so Christ's people have received the abundance of God's grace. They reign in life. Christ's people have also received the gift of justification. That is, they have been made right with God to, in order to reign in life. Gift here in this passage is the word dorea, meaning grace or actually means free gift. It's another word. It's not charis, the normal word for grace. It's dorea, meaning actual free gift. And so let's read verse 17 again. For if by the one transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift, the dorea of righteousness, will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Are you reigning in life? Or are you just acting like an old pauper? We'll begin to see who you are now in Christ. Two choices that changed history. Verse 18. So then, as through the one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through the one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Adam chose to disobey God. You know the story. Adam's one transgression, his act of unrighteousness, doomed us all. His sin of disobedience brought sin and condemnation and judgment into the human race. That's what Adam brought to you. That's a nice heritage, isn't it? Imagine your, your father dies, you open up the, bar, the, the will and says, Son, uh, you owe uh, $20 million for what I wasted over here and you've got to pay i would hate to receive a debt and yet that's what we she received in adam we received a sin debt a disobedience from his disobedience act, adam's act of unrighteousness resulted in condemnation for all men that's what verse 18 says so then through the one transgression the result resulted condemnation to all men what a sad story but the story doesn't end there for the believer Christ chose to obey the Father. The greatest act of obedience of all time. Even so through the one act of righteousness. The one act of righteousness. What was that? That was the son laying his arms out on a wooden cross and, and being lifted up. And, and in that moment receiving God's judgment for sin. Being, uh, having the wrath of God poured out on him so that it would be deflected from you. That one act of righteousness resulted in, in justification of life to all men. Now, not all men accept it, but it's available to all men. Christ's act of righteousness, his death on the cross, brought, brought a remedy for the sin of the whole world. Christ's act of righteousness brought the opportunity for justification to all men. Don't believe these doctrines that say, God, Christ only died for a certain few, for an elect few. Christ died for the sin of the whole world. He laid down his life for everyone. That doesn't mean everyone accepts it. Let's say this building was on fire and you couldn't get out of here and I broke through a hole in the wall and I said, I know the way out. I can get you all out of here. Whoever wants to come out, whoever wants to get out of here, come to me. And half of you come running over to me. And the other half of you say, that's Brett. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to make, I'll find a way out. And so you don't come out and you die. Now, I offered that to every one of you. But some of you believed me and some of you didn't. Christ has found the way for all of you to be made right with God. Some people believe it and some don't. But his one act of righteousness was enough for all. Now let's look at two actions with very different results. Verse 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, 
Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. All right, that's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? Adam's disobedience affected his whole race. Affected his whole race. Adam's disobedience establishes his entire lineage as sinners. Whether they sin or not, they are sinners. That's not fair. Yes, it is. Because look at this. Christ's obedience, obedient even unto the death of the cross, as, as Philippians 2.8 says, affects all who believe. All his born again ones, all of his many, and is freely offered to all of Adam's many. In other words, that act of, obe uh, of obedience, that act of righteousness, uh, affects all who believe. And it is offered to everyone, whether they believe it or not. And it establishes all of his many as righteous. Verse 19 again. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Two spheres, the sphere of law versus the sphere of grace. Let's read first verses 20 and 21. And the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Law. God designed the law to build a case against Adam's many, his fallen race, in order to condemn them to death. Look at verse 20. The law came in that the transgression might increase. God has always sought to clearly define sin to Adam's race. He's wanted them to know the truth. God gave the law to open every eye to humanity's ever-present sin. Otherwise, humanity makes excuses. Sin was in the world before the law but was not easily recognized. We saw that in, Gen in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, where it says, now we, speak, uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Chapter 7 of Romans verse 7 says this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. And I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. In fact, the Yanomam will have a word for coveting, but it was actually considered a good thing. Hand me that new machete that you got there. I want to I want to lust after it. I want to covet it. And that was normal speech until we taught the law. And in that good word that they always thought of it as a positive way, bufiwayu became a negative word once they heard the law. They realized, wow, that's sin. Sin abounded as the result of the law's emergence. Sin abounded as the result of law's emergence. Look at chapter 5, verse 20. It says, the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, and it did, grace abounded all the more. Sin reigned in death by gaining control and giving death to all mankind. That's what it says there. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That, it, uh, that as sin reigned in death, and it did. Grace, on the other hand, this grace is for Christ's race, designed to bring real life to his many. And so God designed something special for Adam's race, 
was called law. God designed something very special for, for Christ's race called grace. Which is greater? Grace, mean, uh, a law which shows sin or grace which gives life? Well, let's see. Verse 21. Uh, actually, verse 20. The law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased... Grace abounded all the more. So sin increased, but grace was even more abundant than sin. This grace is for Christ's race, designed to bring real life to his many. With the coming of the law and the condemnation it brought, grace became the only solution. Grace superabounds wherever the law increases. That's when verse 20, when it says grace abounded all the more, it means grace superabounded. Now that Christ has come and completed his work on the cross, grace and life reign where law and death once dominated. Grace and life reign where law once dominated. Why aren't you gra glad for grace and life instead of law, condemnation, sin, death? It's a lot better sphere to be in, isn't it? This is a much better family if you haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> this is a great place to be found. And you know, Nicodemus, he was over here. And man, he thought he had it all right. Man, he was in the right nation, Israel. He was a ruler, had a good position. He was a Pharisee, good religion. He, he had everything running for him. He, he was probably very wealthy. And yet, Jesus came to him and said, Nicodemus, if you don't get out of that family, you'll never see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. You've got to go from death to life. You know, we, we, we always talk about that the other way, don't we? We talk about you, you're born and then you die. But in the Bible, you're dead and then you're born. And you see, everything's backwards in Christianity. The way up is down. Except the seed fall into the ground to die. It abides alone. And see, God's way is always whatever. If man says it's this way, I can guarantee you, God's way is that way. And so this is what we have in this situation. God's grace brings righteous living with no fear that grace will make people sin. You know who made up grace? I did. I'm the inventor of grace. If that were so, then you should fear it. But I didn't think it up. In fact, you know that there is not one religion in the world other than Chris, true Christianity that has a concept of grace. In fact, we went into the Yanomamo tribe trying to find the word for grace, and, and we couldn't find it. Um, we, we did come up with nofi boa. Nofi meaning friend. Boa meaning for no reason. <laughs> Being a friend for no reason. That was our close call or whatever. There's no word in their language for, for grace. We had to invent a word or invent the concept. Now they're getting it. But it wasn't something that came natural to them. Grace is supernatural. Did you know that Paul had to come up with a word for grace, charis, and then he had to develop it through the scriptures? And so today we have the concept because the Bible establishes this concept. The Old Testament had it already established it uh, with Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, favor. And so God's grace brings righteous living with no fear that grace will make people sin. Verse 21, that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
I want you to take note of that little word there, our Lord, because we're going to begin to now look at the lordship of Jesus Christ in the life of the believer. So this is where lordship comes in, is in sanctification, not in justification. In fact, look at chapter 6, the very last verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ whom? Our Lord. Look at chapter 7, verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at chapter 8, the last verse. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of, Christ, love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our And so now we're going to be talking about lordship, but we're going to do it from a biblical perspective. Not from a legalistic, condemnation-based perspective. We're gonna, we'll be talking about the lordship of Jesus Christ in these passages. And so now, let's go back to our charts and begin to do some more charting. We've seen justification explained. We've seen justification exemplified. We've seen justification's end results. And we've seen identification. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all shall live. That's what we just saw. Now we're going to go to sanctification, the first part of it. Positional sanctification. If you don't understand this, you won't understand Romans 6, 12, and forward, which talks about practical sanctification. So he's just built up this concept of there are two identities. Now he's going to tell you what to do with those identities. And so let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We thank you for the word of God. Teach our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be back.